This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 11, Early England and the Sea. The British Isles were long internationally insignificant, and despite its island situation, the sea did not afford England much protection. England was vulnerable to outside intruders. With no place more than 80 miles or so from the sea, the southeast coast was particularly vulnerable with its uh, shallow coastal waters, beaches, and many rivers inviting deep penetration of interior spaces by oared ships. The English perceived the sea as a source of threat and it is no exaggeration to suggest that Englishmen, until the 16th century, except for nearshore fishing, saw the ocean as an unexplored, unprofitable desert, a space barely understood, a fearsome place of fantasy, an alien cosmos. For Englishmen, venturing into the broad ocean, the Atlantic, offered less favorable conditions than for Iberians who could exploit a clockwise pattern of winds and currents. English sailors had to fight sou'westerlies when sailing westward into the Atlantic. The Normans arrived via the Channel in 1066, a date everyone seems to know, and they conquered England. Their passage is depicted for us in the Bayeux Tapestry, an early masterpiece of medieval marine art. Norman kings and their immediate Plantagenet successors tried to fuse a trans-channel state comprising the British Isles along with nearby Normandy, a fringe of what would become France. This attachment never would become sustainable. Maritime technology of the day simply would not permit it. Within the British Isles, a pattern developed of conquering and co-opting, even destroying the political systems of Celtic peoples whom the Anglo-Saxon English and the Norman French ruling class regarded as inferior racially as well as culturally. The conquerors were first successful in Wales. Much later would come the absorption of Scotland and ultimately Ireland. If we stop to think about it, this protracted war against the nearby Celtic fringes prefigures the whole English oceanic imperial experience. It engendered strong attitudinal similarities persisting between that time and much later, a we-they sense of superiority. In the near abroad, as well as on home islands, these people were aggressive, perhaps to be compared to today's English football fans who, when abroad, are dreaded by their foreign hosts, their behavior rowdy, untidy, often drunken, and belligerently nationalistic. Their ancestors were undoubtedly warlike, among the most bellicose and strenuous of crusaders, personified by the bloodthirsty and violent Richard the Lionhearted, ancestor of many English today and Americans too. Using the channel as passageway, William the Conqueror in reverse, the English maintained a large but fragile territorial base in France, stretching along much of France's Atlantic coast, and they held on to it for several hundred years. The English held Gascony on that coast and at great distance. Thus, England was in two separate parts, a strategic weakness. Nicholas Roger, preeminent historian of the Royal Navy, sees Brest at the western tip of Brittany as the Suez of the medieval English Empire, the hinge 
of a tenuous imperial lifeline. The English fought the French there on the continent, never on home ground, and on land, not at sea. Crecy, Poitiers, Agincourt, names that ring in the memory were all great land battles, recalling those persisting English efforts to build a permanent territorial presence on the continent. The English presence served to choke off the French from their northern and western oceanic fringes. The French absorbed what are today their lands along the Channel first in the 13th century, gaining seacoast along the Mediterranean and part of the Atlantic. The French were most secure in the fertile inland Ile-de-France Corps. Paris became heart of what ultimately would emerge as a nation. The centrality of Paris might be considered a factor in France's ultimate continental orientation. Perhaps it's significant that the French call the channel La Manche as if it were indeed as marginal as a sleeve, and they lacked the confidence to call it La Manche Française, whereas the English boldly called it the English Channel. We can say that before 1492 in Columbus, England's interests and ambitions lay in Europe, not beyond, creating land empires, not oceanic ones. These continental strategies reflected two sources of traditional concern at work there, two sources of linkages. First was the churchly connection. The English were still part of the Roman Catholic world. The authority of the papacy provided a bond with the continent that was both administrative and emotional. King Henry VIII in the 16th century prompted the English Reformation for political and dynastic reasons, not theological ones. This Protestant Reformation would sever England from the cultural an intellectual community to which it had belonged for nearly a thousand years. And it forced the English to develop along isolated, eccentric times. Is this perhaps one reason for taking to the seas? A second linkage with the continent was commercial. Europe offered markets where the English could sell their chief product, raw wool, and coarse cloth, much of it woven in rural cottages. Think of Silas Marner. The English economy rested on the back of the sheep. Symbolically today, the Lord Speaker in the House of Lords sits on a bag of wool. Wool and tin, Cornish tin, was of interest to foreigners as far back as the Phoenicians. The English could also offer lead, hides, and skins to the European market. This describes an inventory defining England as a backward, poor, agricultural nation. The English relied on foreign shippers, Venetians and Flemings, to carry their goods, they relied on foreign bankers to handle their financial dealings. That influence lingers in the city of London, hence Lombard Street, commemorating Milanese bankers from Lombardy. The opening of sea routes in the Oceanic Revolution affected England profoundly. It forms a watershed between medieval and modern life. Then Englishmen laid down their crooks, abandoned their sheep, and took to the sea. English shepherds became English sailors. Although England 
like 90% of the rest of the world, remained a predominantly agrarian society until the Industrial Revolution. Oceanic Revolution made English people interested in every continent except Europe. In the latter half of the 16th century, the Elizabethan age, the ocean emerges as a national concern for the English people, reflected in literature, economic life, and political attitude. England's emergence as a sea power coincides with the flourishing of the language. The King James Bible and the Book of Common Prayer become pillars of it. Shakespeare is drenched with maritime inflections, but he depicted England's strategic situation ambivalently. Recall John of Gaunt's deathbed speech in King Richard II. This fortress, built by nature for herself, against infection and the art of war. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. What does these words say? Wrapped in a mantle of national pride lies an intense insularity and insecurity. Nicholas Roger points out that English governments were overthrown by seaborne invasions at least nine times after 1066, and foreign forces made at least seven other successful landings on British shores. For English people, the sea had functioned largely as an avenue for enemies. But after the Oceanic Revolution, as they learned to use the ocean, they came to sense that it would become their field of fame. They began to look away from the continent, mistrusting it, and this lingers. Note the Eurosceptics and Brexit. Someone said, was it Churchill? We are with Europe, not of it. We are linked, but not comprised. The British people came to believe that maritime power was essential to their very existence. As a 17th century political figure, Andrew Fletcher said, the sea is the only empire that can naturally belong to us. Did any other early modern European state feel that way with the same intensity? Even the Netherlands necessarily diverted its resources to sustaining its fortress barrier against the continent. And since this English belief took form, we can find reasons for it. One would be a long coastline, with an abundance of harbors and anchorages which point to opportunities for fishing. Fish was important to the diet, but fish and chips, which we see today as a staple, was a dish made possible only by the arrival of the potato from the New World. Much of traditional English food was bland. The English took the best raw materials that gray skies and wet soils produced and used long applications of heat to make them marginally edible. Vegetables boiled to death could be made palatable by introducing spices carried in by sea from Asia, pepper and cinnamon, saffron and curry. All these were imports made possible by the Oceanic Revolution. Some would suggest unkindly that British cuisine is an oxymoron, but in the late 20th century, a big change happened. London restaurants today boast 
that they are equal to those of Paris. And so the English take to the sea. Aside from fish and the English diet, the English come to a wide perception of a maritime world and respond to the challenge by taking to the sea. So how did England become a sea power? Stay on board for episode 12 to find out. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Recording by 1623 Studios in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Ferré. Goodbye until next time.